Hello and welcome to the i3 podcast. My name is Wouter Klein and I'm the Director of Content for the Investment Innovation Institute. For more information about our educational forums for institutional investors, please visit our website at www.i3-invest.com. There you can also subscribe to our complimentary newsletter, i3 Insights in which we discuss investment strategy and asset allocation questions with asset owners around the world. Now, as you all know, we love our disclaimers in this industry, so here's ours. This recording is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. Please enjoy the show. Welcome to another episode of the i3 Insights podcast. My name is Daniel Grioli and I'm the Market Fox columnist for i3 Insights. Today I'm in Los Angeles and I'm joined by Tobias Carla. He's the portfolio manager of the Acquirers Fund, a New York Stock Exchange listed ETF investing in value stocks. The ticker for the fund is ZIG or ZIG because Toby's motto is to zig when others zag. So with that, I'd like to welcome Toby to the podcast. Thanks so much, Daniel. That was a great introduction. This zig and zag idea, obviously that's your philosophy as a value investor, but take us right back to the start. How did you get interested in investing? I was uh, was a solicitor in Australia. I worked in mergers and acquisitions. Uh, So I graduated in, I graduated law school from the University of Queensland in 2001 and I started working but I had started working earlier than that in this law firm as a, a research clerk. So I, I actually started on April 2000, which was the very peak of the dot-com boom globally. And so my first few weeks of work, I saw the stock market get crushed. And I had thought that I was going in there to do IPOs and capital raising and venture capital and all that sort of interesting tech type stuff. And the area that everybody wanted to go into then was telecommunications, media, TNT. I was one tell back then, wasn't it? One tell. Sort of stuff. Yeah, those jackals. <laughs> I had a one tell phone, so I don't remember them fondly. But I, I found pretty quickly that the landscape changed very dramatically, and it went from being a capital raising environment to being a mergers and acquisitions environment. And these new investors appeared that we would now call them activists, but at the time they didn't have an, we didn't know that they were activists. They were sort of guys who had been around in the 80s who had been corporate raiders or green mailers in Australia who started getting control of these busted dot-com cash box businesses. And I had, I, I did business as an undergrad and I had read security analysis and the intelligent investor and I was interested in value investing. And I had read Buffett's letters and everybody knows that Buffett likes wonderful businesses at fair prices. And I looked at these businesses and these were just terrible businesses. They, you know, they really had no business model at all. They were losing money, burning cash just because they were selling stuff at a discount to what the stuff was actually costing them to, to buy in the first place. So they were losing money hand over fist. So I couldn't understand why these investors, these activists were trying to get control. And of course it's because they had raised multiple millions of dollars on the stock market, traded down at a big discount to that. And then they could go in and they knew that they could just stop the business. And then all of a sudden you have a listed company with shares that you can use to take over other companies you've got cash that you can use and so they tax losses <laughs> tax losses you can build a daisy chain of these things and a few guys did that in australia and i and i thought at the time i don't have any capital i don't have any money but the next time that i see this happen next time i see a stock market crash and things get really cheap i'm going to make sure that i'm in there buying these kind of companies and so i started thinking in those terms how do you find these sort of companies so i went back to security analysis and i was still working as a lawyer i was working in mergers and acquisitions and we had it was a boom in there was a boom in private equity in australia at that time where it previously hadn't really been institutionalized it became institutionalized and so if you're buying a public company and taking it private and loading it up with debt you've got a lot of work as a lawyer to contract that and then pretty rapidly often these things get into trouble and so you've got to unpack it and 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 go in a different direction so i found that a really fascinating experience and the activism i don't think 
at the time was institutionalized in Australia, or maybe now, but at the time it was still basically individual guys who were who had other jobs. Like I think it was Farouk Khan, the Desert Raider. He was a Perth-based lawyer. He's probably still around. But after all of that, so I sort of, I, to the extent that I have any skills that are transferable from law to investing, they were they were understanding um, activism, understanding how the the valuation of a company for a private equity firm, and then you know the understanding the contracting process or the the disclosures to get control. So I I started focusing my efforts there. Read more on the deep value side, which is companies when they get into a lot of trouble, often trade down because there's a question whether they survive or not. The question's not is this a good business? The question is will this be a business in a year or so? Will it be alive in a year or so? So I started that, that's that's the way I conducted my research. And at the the 2007 bust when that finally rolled around, I saw those net nets appear, or sorry, the sub liquidation value companies appear again on a global basis and I started trying to buy those and did very well buying them in the States and in Australia to the extent that I could find them in Australia. There were a handful around, but there were sort of a hundred hundreds in the States at the time. So I bought those and I wrote them up on a little website called Greenbacked, which was a blog with a funny spelling. It's G-R-E-E-N-B-A-C-K-D.com, like punked. That was the kind of idea that they were companies that were really busted. And I think that's a good exercise if you're if you're if you're starting out as an investor to do the liquidation value analysis on a company is a worthwhile process because it's a balance sheet analysis and you're looking for cash flow. You want to make sure that the business can in fact survive or the business has some value. Sometimes the business has no value. And I became very interested in the research around that. So there's been, you know, Graham wrote about net nets and security analysis. He wrote some articles in 1932. There have been various academic papers written over the years. So in 1983, it was one written by Henry Oppenheimer about net nets and he looked at the performance of net nets which are these sub liquidation value companies and he found that basically the cheaper that the net net was relative to its net so the cheaper the price relative to the liquidation value the better the performance but he also had these odd findings like a profitable net net won't do as well as an unprofitable net net and within the profitable net nets the ones that pay dividends don't do as well as the ones that don't pay dividends the ones that don't pay dividends don't do as well as the ones that do pay dividends. Sorry, the other way around. The ones that do pay dividends don't do as well as the ones that don't pay dividends. So, and I think that there's something, that was the first time that I realized that there is this slightly counterintuitive philosophy when you're in deep value, particularly, that the worse the quality in some respects, the better the performance, which is an unusual kind of idea. But I think it's been, I've seen lots and lots of research since it's borne that out. The problem with net nets is that they are, they're like cicadas. They only come around every seven or eight years at the very depths of a, dot, of, a, of a bust. And so I needed to find some other way to express that philosophy of deep value um, that was scalable and you could use it throughout the entire cycle. So I, I had read a paper in the late 1990s and it's 20 years old this spring in the States called uh, The Endangered Species List or Darwin's Darlings. And it was written by these guys at Piper Jaffray, which is an investment bank here. And they said, basically, there are these companies that have traded that the stock market is in the late 1990s was a lot like it is now, in the sense that the very most, the very glamorous dot com type companies look like they would never be headed, that their businesses would just keep on growing to the detriment of every other brick and mortar type company. And so the brick and mortar got really cheap. The dot coms got very expensive. And these guys did this analysis that said there's this huge swathe of these com companies that are very cheap and good, and they're just never going to be able to get into an index. So they're never going to be bought. They're never going to, the valuation's never going to go up. And uh, the only way that that's ever going to happen is if private equity steps in or if activists step in, which is what eventually happened. So they, I think they called that right. But the metric that they were using was the enterprise multiple, which is the way that private equity firms think about valuation, which is just the market capitalization plus the cash, backing out the debt, looking for any other sort of liability type securities in there that you have to pay out, like uh, preference shares or underfunded pensions and so on. And then on the other hand, and that's the, that's the price that you pay. And then on the other hand, you're looking for the operating income, what's flowing into the business that can be used to service debt and pay tax and various other things. And from that analysis, you can find very cheap companies and various other studies along the way have shown that to be a very good metric. It's not always the best metric, but it is a very good metric. 
So, um, 2006, Joel Greenblatt wrote a great book called The Little Book That Beats the Market. And he advocated this strategy in there called the magic formula, which is just a very simple quantitative idea that he said, let's look at what Warren Buffett does. Warren Buffett likes wonderful companies at fair prices. So how do we define wonderful company? Well, you want something that's got a very high return on invested capital. And that's a, that's a quality metric. And then you want it cheap. You want it cheap on an enterprise value to EBIT rather than EBITDA. It really makes no difference which one you choose. They're, they're roughly the same because Buffett often talks about EBIT operating income is the way he describes it as the way that he measures the, the strength of the companies that he looks at and, and particularly the ones that are already in his own portfolio. Greenblatt tested that magic formula, found that it beat the market over the sort of 12 years of data that he had. After I stopped working as a lawyer in about 2008, I started working in an activist firm and I became very interested in, and this was in Australia, I became interested in applying the sort of deep value principles to finding stocks. When I was doing it for myself, I did it in the States so there could be no conflict between what the activist firm was doing in Australia and what I was doing. And also because I had worked in the States by that stage in m and in San Francisco. And uh, I just became interested in this idea that the acquirer's multiple or the EV EBIT portion of that magic formula would do better than the magic formula itself because I, my experience with it had been that you buy these high return and invested capital companies right at the very pinnacle of their business cycle and they do worse as you go along and that's why they're cheap they sort of it's a backwards looking metric that finds these things that are closer to the top than to the bottom without sort of really knowing what i was doing tried to find a way to test that idea and i said on my little website i'm going to write a book about this this sort of systematic application of value investing strategies without really knowing what that that was being done anywhere in the world and i got contacted by a guy who was at the Booth, which is the old Chicago School of Business, and he said, I want to write a book too. Uh, I can do the back testing, you do the writing of the, you write the words and we'll, that'll be the book and I've got experience writing a book. So that's Wes Gray, who was my co-author in Quantitative Value, which came out in 2012. So we tested that idea that the magic formula would do better without the quality metric and we found that that was in fact the case. So you get better raw performance, you get better risk adjusted performance. And the reason is that for that reason that I'd identified, you're buying these companies close to the top of their business cycle. So if you just randomize that, you say we're not going to worry about whether they're high quality or not, you do you get better performance. It's funny you mention that because I, I ran a version of the magic formula using Australian stocks and the returns were absolutely horrible. And what I realized was that because uh, one of the two factors was this return on capital, it put you into all of the mining stocks at the right. peak of the right. mining yeah, boom. Right. There you go. When their profitability was at peak levels and about to start mean reverting. And I think from memory, I, I wrote a blog post on it. You underperformed the ASX 200 by about 5% a year. Yeah, ouch. Because you, you got on the wrong side of this cycle. So What that, I, after, after quantitative value came out, I, I became very interested in that idea that mean reversion in businesses was as powerful as mean reversion in. So the value investors are trying to take advantage of mean reversion by buying stocks that are trading at an unusual valuation relative to other stocks on, this, on the market. And then I thought, well, this is probably something that exists in, in business cycles as well. And so I, that's basically been my philosophy to try to identify companies that are at a business nadir at the bottom of their business cycle and also at a valuation idea, so closer to the, the lower ratios that you would see over a full cycle. And then you get it both at the advantage of the expansion in the, in the multiple and the, uh, the underlying business doing better. And so that, that's been the, my philosophy for sort of the last decade or so has been to try to apply that. And I, I call that the acquirer's multiple, just so I can, just as a sort of simple way for, for people to understand what I'm doing. There's more to it than that. We do a full valuation and we, it's a holistic examination of the balance sheet and the cash flow statements. We use some of the principles from quantitative investing. So I think quantitative investing is very good at things like sizing. And I think it's very good at things like identifying statistical fraud, statistical earnings manipulation, statistical uh, distress. And I also think it's good at finding things that, you know, short interest, that sort of stuff that it's not necessarily something that you can identify as uh, as a as a qualitative investor, 
so I I apply those sort of principles to to finding stocks that I think are undervalued. They're not necessarily a high quality business, so it's not necessarily something that will grow and compound forever. But it's something that does have real cash flows. They're not they're not accruing some funny asset because there's a disparity between the accounting earnings and the cash flow earnings. That they're, they're over time they're pretty much matched and knowing that the business is not one I'm going to hold forever, but it's a business that is good for the next two or three or five years as it recovers from wherever it's been. Unfortunately, it's sort of run into this period over the last five years where value has um, values had a very rough run in the States and globally. Um, those undervalued port- portfolios have not performed while the expensive portfolios have tended to go ahead. So it's been a very tough time for value, but I think it's it's created this opportunity for value investors where the spread now between the most undervalued stocks and the most overvalued stocks is getting to historic widths. And that has typically, that, that's only occurred a few times in, in a very long data set. And particularly, so I looked at the, I put this on my Twitter account the other day, the fa- using the FAMA French data, which is, for, which is available for free using price to cash flow, which is, a pretty good metric. The uh, the spread is now the underperformance of value relative to growth is the worst it's been going back to 1951, and the spread between the valuations is as wide as it's ever been. And when that's happened before was the late dot com, and in the run up to the Great Depression, which is a little scary. But after both of those, the returns to value were very strong. The one caveat now is that the the undervalued portfolios are not historically cheap. They're, they're, they're expensive. It's just that the overvalued portfolios are extremely expensive. So that's what creates the spread. So to capture it, I think you need to be long short. I think that's an interesting point you raise about the difference between relative and absolute valuation. Because I know when I looked at it, historically, that cheapest quintile of value we use a PE sort of traded on a six or seven PE, um, whereas now that cheapest quintile of value is trading on I think a sort of a twelve to thirteen kind of PE. So it's it's roughly double, um, which I guess shows that if you're just buying cheap stocks long only, the potential returns have got to be that much lower. And then you could argue maybe the risks are also higher if it's true that some of these companies will actually be disrupted and their businesses won't recover. So long only value kind of looks tough. And when people say to me, oh, value is going to outperform growth, I think if that happens, it's probably going to be more growth stumbling rather than these stocks taking off. But this idea of capturing the spread rather than the market return, I think is interesting. So how do you go about creating a long short portfolio? Well, I'm not a factor investor, so there are, there are lots of value factor funds around where they're using price to book or that because that's the traditional value factor or they're using one of the other metrics, one of the other ratios or some combination of them to find them. And then they're, they're creating expensive and cheap portfolios on that and, and hoping to get two things, depending on how the, the fund is structured. But a common structure is 13030, which is what, what I use in mine. Basically, um, that is beholden completely to what the factor does. So if the factor, and there's, the factor has got to historic widths, but there's no reason why it can't keep on getting wider and wider. That's right. And there's also a huge dispersion between how you measure the factor. Right. So you can pick one measure and get very different results to right. and if so you used another one. Yeah. Price to book is one good example of that. And I think that there's the, there are issues with price to book that are cyclical, but there are also issues with price to book that are secular and it's the secular ones that make me nervous because mm. there's no reason why that can't appear in other factors as well. But the secular ones for price to book for people who don't know, there have been gradual changes in the accounting earnings. There are some good papers out there. O'Shaughnessy Asset Management has written one of them where they talk about there are two types of these price to book, cheap price to book companies or, or price to book where price to book fails to accurately sort of categorize these companies as being cheap or expensive. And they call one veiled value and the other one is negative enterprise value. Basically, these companies have done so well over time, then they've bought back so much stock, they have negative equity. Is it McDonald's? I think the post McDonald's is one, yeah. yeah there's, 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 and they've done very well, but price to book can't 
can't examine that and come up with the correct answer as to whether it's overvalued or not. So the price to book factor has had its worst decade in the data and it's negative over the last 10 years, which is absolutely astounding. But the reason for that is that it's just miscategorizing these, these companies. So I think you have to be very careful with factors because that there's a, there is a sort of nice intuition that you're sort of doing this scientific application of uh, you know, removing all human judgment from it and just following what the, the data says. But then you have this problem where the, the rules are changing all the time and so you can't necessarily look back. So that leaves you with a very difficult decision about how you implement a value portfolio. So the way that I do it is I think about valuation in a holistic sense. I try to look at the balance sheet, the financial, the, the, the cash flow statement, the income statement, and try and get an idea where this company is, where it has been historically. And But that's only one component. So on the long side, I prefer value. We want to look for, we want to make sure that it's financially robust, that it doesn't have any of those indicia of fraud or earnings manipulation or financial distress or various other things like that. So would those measures of distress and fraud be something similar to a Petrovsky F score or a Benesh's uh, yeah. so score? I like Pierre Trotsky's a financial strength score. Yeah. The problem with Pierre Trotsky is that it only looks at shares being bought back and it doesn't look at share issuance. So I prefer one that looks... So there's, there's a lot of companies that they're issuing stock all the time because they've got options or whatever. And then they're buying back enough stock to keep their their share count roughly flat, but there's nothing particular. But if the Pierre Trotsky only sees the buyback, it doesn't see the issuance. Okay. So it needs to be adjusted to, to capture both. Um, but otherwise, it's a pretty good metric. The problem has been that it hasn't worked very well outside of a very low price to book universe. And that tends to be the very smallest company. So you've got bid ask spreads and you've got other measurement problems there. And it seems to be that it, it only tells you sort of the difference between low and high scoring companies rather than it's the gradients in between. Yeah, yeah. it's nine gates yeah. and it can be failing on an important gate and it still says it's, it's a good company. Some of the gates are more important than other gates. So I don't use Piotrowski, but I understand the intuition of it. I don't mind it as a metric. I just don't like, I don't, I don't like to use it personally. But yeah, I use Benish, some variation of Benish. You can use Altman Z score. Benish is the manipulation score. Altman is the, the financial distress score because financial distress, you can't use bankruptcy because that's a, it's either in bankruptcy or it's not in bankruptcy. It's a sort of binary issue, whereas you don't want them in, naturally you don't want them in bankruptcy, but they're not in bankruptcy right until the point that they declare bankruptcy. So you need some sort of way of assessing the risk that they're going to progress onto bankruptcy. The funny thing is I use, I use all of these statistical measures at the very beginning of the process to make sure that the universe of stocks that I'm going to buy from is a good universe, is a healthy universe. And you find that applying those rules improves the performance of that universe materially. You get a couple of points of performance additional over the index by by doing that but if i look at the final portfolio the final portfolio would never have selected any of those companies that are weak on an altman or benish anyway because it favors companies that are generating cash flows companies that are buying back stock companies that have got cash on the balance sheet anyway so it does it i I do it because I, i think that there's a risk that you could end up with one of them in the portfolio but i've never even if I don't do it, it, it doesn't buy those kind of stocks, which is an interesting thing. So if I understand you correctly, if a company is generating cash, it kind of stops it from ever getting into that kind of distress in the first place right. in one way. It could, I mean, it could, it could have an enormous amount of debt, like debt could be, but then that would not get through. That would be, it would be very difficult for something on an enterprise multiple basis to get through that unless it had very, very strong operating income and then maybe the risk isn't there. So that's the long side is a very traditional value portfolio where I care less about quality me- measured and return on invested capital. I care about quality in the sense of are the cash flows real? Is the balance sheet fit? Various things like that. The short side is a different sort of a slightly different process. There's still a valuation element to it, but the valuation element is less important. Much more important on the short side is financial distress earnings manipulation, fraud, and all of those things tend to go together. And these are typically companies that are negative cash flow to a significant number relative to what they've got on the balance sheet. They're issuing stock to stay alive, or they're raising debt to stay alive. On a, and that's a quarter to quarter proposition for them. 
and they're extremely expensive. You know, to the extent that you can come up with a valuation for them, they're extremely expensive. And often it's because they have a trickle of earnings relative to a very debt heavy balance sheet. And so I, I can show the portfolio to anybody and any traditional value investor would say that's the sort of stuff you don't want to buy or that is the sort of stuff you do want to short. The problem with that, again, and this is the big lesson that I have learned over the last five years in particular, but over the last decade, is that that still identifies companies that are going up a lot. You're still going to buy something like Netflix and you're still going to buy something like Tesla until more recently. The the thing that I have done, the, the thing that I implemented about five years ago that has kept me out of a lot of that stuff is just to, just to add in a momentum overlay on top of that. And I use a very, very simple momentum overlay. I just say, is the stock below where it was a year ago? Because I think that what that, that demonstrates or the rationale for it might be that the investor appetite for the story or the narrative that has propped up that stock has now gone away. So that's kept me out of I, I, I've never gone close to buying Netflix, but you might look at Netflix's balance sheet and say, well, there's a lot of debt on that balance sheet. It's still got a pretty good business, but it's burning a lot of cash too. You might think that same way about Amazon as well. I think Amazon is a very good business and there's no debt on that balance sheet. That's no net debt on that balance sheet. But that is, that lots of people have tried to short Amazon over the years. They've tried to short Netflix and been carried out feet first. Tried to short Lulu Lemon is another one. So it just keeps you out of those kind of um, front page glamour stocks. One of the interesting case studies, I think, is it kept me out of Tesla for a very long time. But about um, Q3 last year, Tesla came into the screen because it hadn't been, hadn't done anything for a year. And Tesla's got a very junky balance sheet. It's got negative cash flows. Tesla's in a lot of distress. And the funny thing is, because I'm active on Twitter, I see there are two groups on Twitter. There's this group that describes themselves as Tesla Q. So for those people who don't know, in, in the States, when a company goes into bankruptcy, but it's still traded, it gets a Q at the end of its ticker indicating that it's in bankruptcy or that it's going through the, 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 the process. And so these guys have called themselves Tesla Q to say that they think that Tesla's going into bankruptcy. And so they're full of conspiracy theories and they fly drones. Over. It's, it's hilarious. I don't think it's any way to invest, but I do think it's very funny. But I, I don't need to be in that conspiracy group. I don't, I don't think you need a conspiracy. I think that Tesla's financial statements are damning for Tesla. And I don't know necessarily, I don't know what that means, but I do know that it means, I don't know what it means for the business over the very long term. I don't know if it's a zero or not, but I do know that I think it's a good risk adjusted bet when it's, so I can, I contrast there, I have two automobile stocks in the portfolio at the moment. I've got Fiat Chrysler on the long side and Tesla on the short side. Now Tesla's market cap is twice Fiat Chrysler's. It's got a lot more debt in there and it's got negative cash flow, whereas Fiat Chrysler's got about $2 billion in debt, but it generates $6.5 billion in operating income every time, every year, so it can pay off its debt three times over every year, whereas Tesla's got more debt and $200 million in negative free cash flow. So I, and, and, and Tesla issues stock to stay alive, whereas Fiat Chrysler has been buying back stock and spinning out assets and various other things like that. But Tesla's done a lot better than Fiat Chrysler has, and so that's why the this is why this has been an unusual time in the markets and a difficult time for guys who are value investors because it, that what you might think is logical and sensible goes against you on a repeated basis. So it's been a it's been a difficult and humbling time for value guys like me. But I think that these periods I wasn't in the market in the late 1990s, but I can see that the same phenomenon occurred then, and then the returns post that were very good for value. You reminded me of a story talking about shorting. So uh, back in 2015, I went to uh, Columbia Business School to do the, the executive version of the value investing program. And we used a case study method. And one of the stocks that we used was Amazon. And so Bruce Greenwald is out there talking about you know, Amazon, how, how overvalued it is, how it's just insane. So I put my hand up being the smart Alec that I am and ask the question it's okay well if you hate it so much are you short it and turns out he was big time he had a, a huge position he went on to elaborate on on why and how big and how he was able to scale that position up even if it went against him etc and about a year later I ran into an industry colleague who'd also been to the same program in 2016 and I asked him, I said, so is Bruce still talking about being short Amazon? 
and he mentioned that it was still one of the case studies in the course, but Bruce was singing a very different tune because he he'd been taken out in a big way by it. He had to he was forced to cover at a very very large loss, and uh, the the point that he told his the class was. He still believed it was overvalued, but some stocks, you know, it's very difficult to short a cult. Right. That you know, if it just has this core of people that are willing to to fund the business's growth at a very low return, it's it's hard to fight that. The difficulty is, and I, this is just something that I've observed over the last ten years, five years in particular, is that if you have these companies that, so. Just, I mentioned Netflix before as having a junky balance sheet, but I do think the underlying economics of, of Netflix's business are interesting, but the growth rate is very high too. True also of Amazon. I think Amazon is a phenomenal business underneath the hood mm. and it's growing also at a very rapid rate. It could be rate. profitable today if they stopped really right. investing. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So that's what, and Amazon is run like a private company. They try to minimize their taxes. They try to minimize all of that sort of stuff. It's very cleverly run, which is why which is why Bezos is so wealthy. But if you look at something like Netflix, if you're short and it's if it's at whatever silly whatever silly multiple it's at, if you're short and the next financial the next reporting period shows that they've grown 30% and those multiples just exp- the multiple remains the same, you're going to be 30% behind on that short. So that's what happens to these businesses. They get they are silly expensive, but because their growth is so high, you're always short that fundamental growth, even though you personally think it's the, the multiple is too high. It's just, it's a losing proposition. Yeah. So I, I studied guys like uh, Chanos and Einhorn. Einhorn sort of in the negative sense and Chanos in the positive sense. Chanos's returns are phenomenal. He's been around for a very long time. He's been through lots of different market cycles. How does Chanos generate such good returns being a, mostly a short, he's a short only guy, but their portfolios aren't necessarily structured that way. How does he do that? Whereas Ironhorn sort of seems to step on rakes over and over again. And I think that Chanos is less interested in shorting on valuation. That's not the way you short. I think the way that Chanos likes to short is what I've set up before. You're looking for, you want financial distress, you want fraud, you want stock being issued all the time. All of those things are on your side. They're in your favor as a short. Whereas if you're shorting on valuation, some of those things are against you. You get a guy who's charismatic enough running the business, like Musk, for example. He can always talk at... He's a phenomenal entrepreneur. He's very charismatic. The next time they go to raise capital, there's probably a pretty good chance that they get it done. In Tesla, though, I think they either get it done at a much lower valuation, in which case I don't mind being short. Yeah, your comments about integrating momentum into the short side reminded me of a a book that i read called uh dead companies walking Mm -hmm. by scott fear yeah and he made the point that in terms of the hit rate shorting you're much better off looking for companies that are already you know a price decline and that have declining revenues and other metrics in the business that are going against them that even though you don't get the same reward as if you pick a company at its peak your your success rate on your shorts goes up and that more than compensates for a slightly lower return. The other thing that I like to do is just to keep the positions very small. So a short in my portfolio is 1% at inception and then rebalanced back to 1% on a regular basis. Because that's, that's the other problem that you have with a short. If you're wrong and it keeps on going against you, it just gets bigger and bigger. The problem gets bigger and bigger and you have to deal with that problem at some stage and take that loss. So you have to, for me to deal with that properly. I do that on a systematic basis. It just has to get paired back. And then you want the performance of that short portfolio as a whole. That's the way that I examine the performance. And then I look at that, I look at that short portfolio and I say, well, is that, do the, are the characteristics of the companies in that short portfolio a better short than shorting the index, which might be a safer way of doing it? And the, the answer is always unavoidably yes, because they're carrying so much debt. They've got terrible cash flows and I might contrast that with my long portfolio so they're extremely expensive they're losing a lot of cash they're heavily indebted they're issuing stock whereas my long portfolio is the other so I I think about it at a portfolio level Um, I think about it at an individual stock level and I think that that's the 
the only way to do it because you have to recognize that there is a lot of risk in shorting. It would also increase your dividend yield, wouldn't it? Because I'm guessing most of the stocks you're shorting wouldn't pay dividends or would pay low dividends and that frees up capital to buy more of the value stocks, which I'm guessing pay higher dividends. So the dividend yield on my long portfolio is close to 5%. I don't actually, I don't, I don't use dividend yield as a metric. This is just something that that's just a, that's a side effect, if you like, that that's not what I've identified. The short portfolio, the dividend yield is 0.15 it's base, basis points. It, it is a little surprising that some of them pay dividends. The, one of the problems with, with running an ETF is that those dividend payments are charged against the expense ratio. So my management fee in the, divi- in, the, in the ETF is 79 basis points, but the expense ratio is 94 basis points. And the reason for that is there's 15 basis points of, of dividend yield against me, but I don't get the dividend yield credited to me on the, on the long side, unfortunately, because you know, it's 130 long at 5%. Mm-hmm. It's a very material portion of, of income into the fund. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, they're, they're definitely lower dividend paying, but I would prefer that that was zero. <laughs> I'm interested to ask you about why you chose to launch the fund as an ETF, because uh, with ETFs, I guess started out as largely a passive vehicle, and then there was obviously the move to smart beta and alternative indexes, and now you've seen a few active managers sort of dabble, uh, dabble in the format. Um, why did you choose to go ETF as opposed to mutual fund or some other structure? ETF has a very significant capital gains tax advantage that uh, that the mutual fund or an LP or a managed account don't have. And that is any of those mutual fund LP managed account in the States are flow through. So if the manager makes a sale and there's a capital gain in that, that capital gain flows out to the investor who holds it in an ETF because they have this create redeem custom basket. Uh, they use the create redeem function of the custom basket basically that you, you can leak out the capital gains through some losses and some, and uh, if it's managed properly over the course of the year, there should be no capital gain for the investor who holds it. So I think it makes it a phenomenal investment for someone who's holding it in a taxable account that you don't get that capital gain put to you because that's very, very material. You can look at some of the mutual funds that have been around for a long time that They've got big gains in Apple or whatever it might be. And if they sell those and they put them to you, you can be economically negative on that position, even though it might still be trading roughly where it was. So that was the, that's the main reason for doing it that way. There's also sort of a philosophical reason that I think that the trend in asset management is towards lower fees and more liquid products. The problem for uh, you know, limited partnership is a, it's a complicated um, contracting process. It's roughly 200 pages. You've got to give what ten, what's often a high net worth individual, very big document for them to go through with a lot of frightening legal boilerplate in it. And that, that often ends the discussion, particularly if you're like me, you're a smaller manager, an independent manager, got a funny accent in the States, <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I thought the way to overcome a lot of those problems is just to make this a, a much simpler decision, a much simpler investment process. And because I'm sort of, I'm not, I'm not quantitative, but I am systematic in my approach that does fit into an ETF type structure. So the ETF is actually passive. It's got an index in it and it follows that index, but I create the index. So I pick the stocks that go into it, but it will still possess an enormous active share when you compare it to the S&P 500, they, they, they're wildly different and it will have a very idiosyncratic return path that will look nothing like the S&P 500, although the universe is the S&P 1500. So that's a, that's a combination of, of various different S&P, S&P indexes that it's roughly the largest 90%. It's the 90%. It's the largest 25% of stocks by number. It's the largest 90% by market capitalization. So it doesn't miss much, but it's a big enough universe for um, my philosophy to work for the for the deep value to work because it it captures that sort of minimum market capitalization is about two and a half billion dollars in that universe, which is where you find professional activism and you find professional private equity coming in and taking you out of some of these positions, which is a big part of what I'm trying to do. So you mentioned that the smaller stock is you know, roughly that two two and a half billion, which in U.S. terms is a small cap company because I think 
the smaller stock in the S and P five hundred is about four billion, is it? I think. Or yes, it's not. So yeah. it's it's not. It, it could be even bigger than that. I'm not. I, yeah. I don't know the cutoff for the S and P five hundred, but it's sure. it's certainly a small cap stock. So you you so you've got a mix of small and large. How do you approach the sector question? Do you have any sector constraints on your portfolio, or you just go where the the value and the and the the fraud or the distress is? That's a great question, and it's uh, it. I spent a lot of time thinking about it because I think that there are many allocators who want you to be sector neutral or um, or or to be close to sector neutral. The problem with it is that and it's a it's a double edged sword, but in order to um, generate the best outperformance, the best compounding, and I want this to be an alpha strategy, to do that, you have to go where the undervaluation is. Then that means industry concentration. Because industries tend to get cheap, companies get cheap in industries at the same time because every the, whatever is ailing the industry ailing, ails every single stock in there. So you need to be able to get concentrated, in my opinion. That does create a risk that you have some idiosyncratic performance and you're going to have some underperformance, but that's that's sort of a, a feature, not a bug of value that it has that. Um, it does have this idiosyncratic performance path. So in the early 2000s, when the stock market was falling, the undervalued deciles were advancing. And so a lot of value investors who were long only guys in the States made their name getting started around then by generating positive performance in a negative market. And then, you know, the, the, the other side of the coin is what we've seen more recently where the market is very strong and value has been pretty weak. So it's a double edged sword and it's ultimately, I think it comes down to the philosophy of the manager and mine is that I, I think over the long term, the best performance comes from concentrating into the cheap stuff and, and selling out of the, the, the expensive stuff. So for me, I don't use those industry constraints or sector constraints. So in terms of concentration, is your portfolio equally weighted? Or? I, I do equal weight. And the reason that I do that, I think once you get down to the very pointy end, it's, it's difficult to say that the 30th stock is... So my portfolio is 30 positions long at 4.3% recurring and 30 positions short at 1% each. It's difficult to say that the 30th cheapest stock is much worse than the, 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 the very cheapest stock. I think that once you're in that sort of, I think my universe is about 1500 stocks. So 30 stocks is um, the deciles 150, so it's one fifth of that. So it's a very, you're already at the very pointy end. So to, to say that 30 is worse than, one, than the first one, I think it's too hard to say that. Mm. And I think that you get enough, so you get enough of the rebalancing performance by holding something at 4.3% long. If it goes up, then I can rebalance out of it and I take a little bit of the performance and reinvest it in the cheaper stuff. So you do get that, what I call Shannon's Demon. Mm-hmm. You know, Shannon, Claude Shannon, who uh, featured in Fortune's Formula, which is a book about Kelly betting and various other things. Fascinating book, one of my favorite books. And, Claude Shannon had this idea where he said, what if you have these, you can uh, you basically have these uncorrelated or anti-correlated assets. And when one goes down, you allocate to it. And when the other one is going up, you take the money away from that. And over time, you create this Shannon's demon rebalancing effect where uh, you can have a portfolio where the two underlying holdings or the underlying holdings are, their performance is negative over time, provided that they're anti-correlated and the performance of the portfolio can be positive. So there's an enormous amount, and that's what long short value does for you. You get that Shannon's demon across the long and the short, and you also get the Shannon's demon by rebalancing by rebalancing the uh, the long portfolio. So I try to I want that advantage. I want as much advantage as I can possibly get in the portfolio. So I'm glad you brought up Shannon's demon, and he was actually a great investor. Mm. His long term returns were phenomenal, um, but he didn't rebalance though. But I think that was maybe due to the fact that commissions were very high when he was investing and that would have played a part. We well, never sold stock. Yeah. So he was, because he was at MIT, I think, he was at Bell Labs and possibly MIT, but he knew a lot of, he knew the guys who eventually, who set up Motorola and he knew all of these techs, the, the guys who founded these companies and he put some money in and then he let it compound. And so his portfolio was like 90% Motorola when he passed away, but he had these other holdings too and he held them for 25 years and he was up. 1,000 times on, on many of these positions. 
but he held one that I think his worst performer, he was up like 50 times on it or something like that. It's not bad. I'll take those kinds of uh, opportunity costs any day. But he didn't take the Shannon's Demon philosophy into his own portfolio, but he did come up with the idea, yeah. so I give him credit yeah. for it. That's interesting because if I'm remembering the story correctly, uh, Paul Samuelson attended his presentation of that idea and there was a long-running a feud between Samuelson and the various proponents of Ke- of the Kelly criterion. Right. Samuelson trying to say that it doesn't work, and a lot of toing and froing over the years. Well, I think it's a, I th- I'm particularly fascinated in the the creation of the Kelly criterion. So uh, that was John Kelly, who was a physicist at Bell Labs, chain smoking, died of a heart attack or a brain aneurysm on a New York City sidewalk at like forty four years of age. Just a very young guy when he died. He, he put the, the theory of it, so Claude Shannon invented information theory, which is one and zero on and off, which basically gives rise to every bit of computing that we have, the Boolean operators and all that sort of uh, decision. The, 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 basically, the, the logic for all computers, is it came out of Claude Shannon. And, so, and he worked at Bell Labs, and so uh, John Kelly had to write his paper as if it was a Bell Labs paper. So he had to write in the context of a communication so he was in, he's interested in betting because he's a betting he's a gambling Texan, but he has to write this paper as if it's like a formal Bell Labs research paper into a noisy telephone line, and that's so Fortune's formula describes it as being, I think it was horse racing, but the paper itself, which you can find online, and I grabbed it and had had a read of it, he talks about it as being a noisy. Uh, there's a baseball game going on, and you're able to get a message from the baseball game over this telephone line, and it tells you whether the team has won or lost and you're then able to make a bet before that information gets to the bookie so you you know the answer so you can go and bet with absolute certainty how much of your bankroll should you bet and if you're absolutely certain the answer is you should bet 100 percent of your bankroll that's an easy decision to make but what if it's a noisy telephone line and you can't hear you can't quite pick up whether they won or not so now you think that they won but you have some sort of degree of uncertainty about whether they won or not how much then should you bet? And obviously you don't bet your whole bankroll because you'd be wiped out. So he was kind of interested in how you uh, maximize the geometric rate of growth of your portfolio given these uncertainty criteria. And he worked out that it's the edge over the odds. So what do you think? What, what is your personal information over the odds that you're offered? And it's kind of fascinating because you can plug in any idea into this and come up with an answer. And that's how much of your you should bet no more than that amount, basically, is what Kelly tells you. It tells you the outer limit of how much you should bet. So I like it in, in a value investing context because Buffett, because he's so smart, picks up on this idea and then he starts sort of applying some variation of Kelly as an investor and uh, so does the, the mathematician from Irvine, probably beat the dealer. Ed Thorpe. Ed Thorpe picks it up, right, applies it in blackjack, then applies it in the markets. And it seems like a pretty good idea. Monish Pabrai writes The Dando Investor, which is this book, and he talks about, you know, he understands what Buffett says. He tries to apply Kelly. He says he, and he gives the example of Stewart Enterprises, which was this funeral home. And he said at the time that he conducted this, he had this three scenarios for this valuation, and it fell out that he should put 90% of his portfolio into this thing. And he said at the time he didn't do it because he didn't know about it, and he only put in 10%, which I think was actually the right decision and 90% yeah. was the wrong decision. But the most fascinating part of it is that it becomes this very popular idea in value investing. And so Ed Thorpe's son goes to the Value Investing Congress in Pasadena and he hears everybody talking about Kelly. And he comes home and he says, Dad, everybody's now using the thing that you popularized because Kelly didn't ever get to use it. Ed Thorpe's yeah. the guy who used it in, in, in real life. And Thorpe immediately says, well, that's wrong. And Thorpe's a mathematician, so he yeah. writes this mathematical proof showing why value investing, value investors applying Kelly are doing it in the wrong way. And they're, obviously, as soon as you start trying to use it, you become aware of all the limitations for it. You can't, you can't get anywhere near mathematical certainty. It's with. heavily dependent on correlation. If, things are co- if you, 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 you really want to be using it with bets that are uncorrelated from each other. So in blackjack, or in any, it's only ever used with one bet on at a time. So it's bets in series, but nobody invests that way. You've, you invest in parallel. You've got a whole number of positions in your portfolio. And because the nature of Kelly is that any positive expectation bet should have some small portion of your portfolio, 
you need to start looking at every single asset class in the world and including some portion of that in your portfolio. So you probably should have some gilts, you should probably have some treasuries, you should probably have lots of these other positions. And then that naturally scales down how big you can get in any given position, even if you think it's a good risk adjusted bet. So that was his main point. He also said it ignores the possibility of black swans. Basically, well, it's heavily just, reliant on subjective probability. And, that's, and, and that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's what I was referring to before. And so the first time you try to apply it, you're like, well, you can, I think you can reverse engineer the odds that you're offered because you can look at what you can look at the market versus your position where, where it's priced relative to its value. But then what's your private information? That's much, much harder to kind of get any certainty around. So it doesn't really work in a practical sense for value investors. I think equal weighting is as valid as sort of sizing into bigger positions, but what you think are your better positions. Well, I think uh, particularly in the context of your fund, you know, even if you're equally weighting on the long side and ending up with 4.33% in each stock, in most cases, that's going to be multiples of what the market weight of that stock right. is. Right. So in terms of taking an active bet, it's still going to be a very active bet. It's a massively active bet because it's 30 long and 30 short out of a 1500 stock universe. So it's it's already right. I'm, I'm hoping that I'm right in the very extremes of that universe. And so the performance of it, partially it'll be, it will be, it, you just can't get away from the value factor. It will be tied to the value factor because I'm a value guy and that's the way it's going to perform. But it's also going to have this idiosyncratic performance that is just the randomness of that portfolio, my own influence on that randomness. So when you were testing this, you, you mentioned the idea of, you know, hopefully some activists and uh, private equity people taking some of the companies out. When you were testing this idea, sort of how often did that happen where you'd own something that would get acquired? Because the holding period, so the rebalancing that I'm doing in the portfolio is quarterly, the holding periods are reasonably short. So the actual, uh, the likelihood, and that it's 30 positions, you know, long out of, out of 1,500. So the likelihood that something gets taken out is actually very low. It's about 2% is what I've found. So what, what, tends to, what tends to happen often is that there's just some improvement in the underlying business or um, the valuation just gets recognized as being too stretched and just the market naturally sort of goes back in the other direction or management does something, management takes some step to buy back some stock or to sell something off or try to pay down some debt because that's something that I'm looking for. I want them paying down debt or I want negative investing cash flows, which means that the, the cash is being paid out to debt or to buy back stock. So the, the likelihood that it gets hit is actually quite low and it's much more likely that something else happens. But I still think because I'm, I think that I'm thinking like a private equity investor or an activist, that that intuition is right. And that if it becomes cheap enough, if the, the sort of cord between valuation and price gets too stretched or it breaks, then you do have that possibility of these guys stepping in and doing something. So you mentioned as well how uh, EV to EBITDA is the the acquirer's multiple that's at the heart of the valuation process. And we see every day new and strange abuses of EV EBITDA. I'm thinking of WeWork and community-adjusted EV EBITDA. Perhaps you can tell our listeners, because obviously you're looking at this very closely, you know, what are some of these tricks that people are using to try and massage the multiple? And, and what does that mean for investors? There are many... There are many problems with using EV. I use EBIT, operating income EBIT, but I've tested EBIT and EBITDA and they're, they're, uh, they're identical in a back test, basically. that there's just It's noise, the difference between the two, but it has been to, to EBIT's advantage over, over years. So Buffett has a criticism. Buffett and Munger have criticisms of, of EBITDA uh, and their criticisms are, one is that when the company gives you its calculation of EBITDA, EBITDA is a non-GAAP measure. It's not an accounting measure. It's something that you have to reconstruct. If you let management give you their estimate of EBITDA, it's going to be highly favorable to the company. And then you have these crazy applications of EBITDA, which are the community adjusted EBITDA, all that sort of nonsense. I would never see them and they don't factor into my valuation. I'm doing my own calculation of operating earnings. And there, there are various little ways that I have to be careful to make sure that I'm getting the best estimate that I can get. Um, Buffett and Munger have another criticism of EBITDA, and that's in the context of leverage, like in a leverage buyout, that 
you, you you use this sort of EBITDA as an estimate for what you can pay for it, and they just say the metrics get it's not tethered to reality. But I still think that it's a good. It's just I, I don't I don't like management's estimate, and I don't use it as an estimate to support debt. I'm just trying to get an idea. I'm just looking through beyond what the the capital structure, tax and interest are doing to that flow and trying to get the best performance out of or get the most accurate picture of what is happening. But the um, every time I mention the fact that I like EBITDA, the yeah. first thing that everybody says is, you know what Buffett and Munger say about it. And of course I know, but their criticisms are valid criticisms, but they're not criticisms of using the metric. But it's interesting too that they criticize it, but John Malone, who's obviously in very high respect by held in very high respect right. by Buffett, he pioneered it. Because he had these and it's entirely appropriate to what he was doing, because he was saying you buy these assets that are long lived assets that you gotta you've got to um, you gotta depreciate these assets and it hides the value the true economic picture of what these assets are doing, which is they are generating enormous amounts of cash flow once they're or EBIT. I use EBITDA as the accounting version of cash flow, and you can compare it to cash flow, but cash flow is also an imperfect metric. Free cash flow is an imperfect metric because it reflects what management's doing with dividends and other things. Cash flow itself is an imperfect metric because it's just reconstructed from the income statement. It's not, it's not, it's not something that sits there out there like an independent check on what the company's doing. It's a re- it's a reverse engineering of what the accountants say the operating income is. Even having said all of that, when you apply that enterprise multiple or acquirers multiple, as I like to call it, to any given company, because the accounting of the company, each each company has its own idiosyncratic accounting, it's unique accounting, and some companies, some industries always look better on an accounting basis than the economic reality of the underlying business. And one example of that is insurance. So because insurance assets are carried on the balance sheet but liabilities are often not because the liabilities are contractual then that looks like the enterprise value is much lower than it otherwise is because you might give them credit for the cash that they're that they're holding where that cash is actually supporting a liability that's just not written into the balance sheet so i want to be careful that and this is part that i have a screening process and then i have a second step which is a forensic accounting diligence and i use i hesitate to say this because it's very faddish to do this but it is a part of the process and it is an important part of the process, but there is a machine learning component that looks at management's discussion and analysis, the MDNA section and the notes to pull out anything in there. Are there con- convert- is there convertible debt? Are there liabilities? Are there underfunded pensions? Are there other things that should be properly included on the that are bal- genuine balance sheet debts that just for whatever reason the accounting fails and it's not included in there? So I think that's that's a trap if you're using that multiple. And I recognize that as a trap, so I'm very careful to to, um, to make sure that it doesn't get fooled. So I want the economic reality of the company, whatever the balance, whatever the financial statements say. The financial statements are the first step, but they're not the final step. Thanks for taking us through uh, EV Ebert in more detail. It's um, interesting to understand some of the nuances around how to make the metric work. I want to come back to something that we were, we sort of touched on when we were talking about Kelly, and this is this idea of concentrated portfolios. And um, I'm, I'm interested to see, because I, I use concentrated portfolios myself, some of the criticisms of that. And I, I read a paper recently published by Vanguard where they were sort of putting out the idea that it's a very small set of stocks that drive the market's total return. So if you look at the stock market's return is negatively skewed, but the returns of individual stocks is positively skewed, and it's these small outliers that account for. And the criticism is that you know, if you're concentrating and you miss those, then that's it. Right. And therefore, you should be in a passive vehicle so you know you have at least some money allocated to those stocks. Well, that's two different things, right? Yeah. That's that one is one is identifying a problem and one is proposing a solution. So the problem, I agree that that is a problem. So if you look at a concentrated portfolio, by definition excludes an enormous number of stocks. Now I say I'm excluding the ones that aren't going to go as well as the ones that I'm including. So I think that that's a good bet. But 
if we look at the performance history of value portfolios, just using FAMA French data, something like that, as I, as I was discussing at the start, clearly there are very long periods where the value portfolios are selecting the wrong stocks because it's going down or not going as well as the rest of the market. And that cycle happens on a regular basis. And I say, and lots of other value guys say, that's what keeps value as a strategy that survives over the very long term because it has these short-term periods of underperformance. The next part of what the Vanguard, the man from Vanguard was saying, that's the solution to the problem. So there are lots of different solutions to the problem, but buying an index. So if, if I go and look at the index and I look at the way that the index is composed, the composition of the index itself, would I go out and recreate that portfolio? As an investor, would I go and recreate that portfolio for myself? No way. Because it's, it's, it's concentrated into the very biggest and most overvalued stocks and it doesn't hold enough of the most undervalued stocks. But it is true that it's a very hard index to beat. Most active managers can't beat it. And that's a combination of the cost, the fee in their, in their portfolio, but also the fact that they have these behavioral biases that force them to do the wrong thing. And so I, I think, and Buffett and lots of other guys have dealt with this and said, most people are gonna be better off in a Vanguard total market fund with the lowest possible fee. And it's sort of partly my arrogance or my bias that I think that a value portfolio should do better than the market over the very long term. And I think that I can construct a value portfolio that will do better than the market over the long term. But there will be long periods of time, like the one we've just gone through, where it will underperform. And so the risk to a value investor and to an investor in a value fund is that underperformance that active share being negative and leading to, and if you can't handle that underperformance, then be in the index. You're reminding me of a paper that uh, Research Affiliates put out, I think it was Jason Su, that showed you know, the common belief was that value investors earn that return at the expense of growth investors. And what he found is they actually earn it at the expense of other value investors. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? <laughs> they can't stick with it. <laughs> a... But there's clearly, there's a very big behavioral component. And once you, once you've bought one stock, you realize how powerful, like I always say the stock market is one of the great tools for revealing your own personal psychopathology. What is it that you do wrong in a gambling sense? Yeah. You know, do you like to pyramid up on your bet? Do you like to, are you scared out of a position really easily? Are you just sort of bloody minded and every time it goes down, you buy more and you do that all the way to zero and vaporize some gigantic portion of your portfolio. So I'm, aware I, and I'm I'm as filled with those psychopathologies as anybody else is so how do I then get an advantage over the market where other people have their own biases and I think one way of doing it is to have an extremely disciplined quasi quantitative systematic approach to doing it where and I've been doing it for long enough now that it becomes intuitive like I like seeing an ugly stock that fits my criteria now I feel positive about those stocks but at the very start of it when I started doing this, I'd look at those stocks and I would be terrified because I would, I can, I can see why they're going down. I'm not an idiot. I know why they're cheap. But that's the thing. You know, they say, well, what about this problem that this particular stock has? And I say, well, that's why it's cheap. Like you don't get them cheap if they don't have hair on them. That's right. They've got to be cheap, cheap for a reason. So thinking about this sort of concentrated long short value, uh, one of the things that I always found as a, a multi-manager investor is that I was creating a portfolio often where I had to combine uh, five or six managers together and what was always challenging in doing that were the interaction effects and I used to describe it as a kindergarten problem you know, when you're in kindergarten you put a bit of yellow paint on the canvas and then you put a bit of blue paint on top and it turns to green and you think this is great I can mix colors together you, know, you do it with blue and red you get purple but whenever you put the third or the fourth color on, you get brown. Right. doesn't matter which colors you use, it goes to brown. And I used to see a similar thing in portfolios that once you start putting managers together, the redundancy and the interaction really changes the way they behave. And it was funny too, trying to explain that to fund managers that would come in and present and talk about what they do, because they'd say, you know, we're great at what we do. This is our strategy. And I'd kind of have to explain to them, well, yeah, that's not really the problem I'm trying to solve. I'm trying to find solve a problem where I find you know, four or five of 
you managers that play nicely together. And what I think is interesting about the kind of approach you've described is that it's because it's a very concentrated and focused value exposure, it's probably more likely to be quite clean in the sense that it doesn't have other residual factor exposures, probably going to behave very differently to other things going on in your portfolio, uh, which I think is interesting because then you, you're kind of getting value and not any of the other stuff and less likely to suffer from the kindergarten problem. I think it's interesting that you, you've raised that as a multi-manager investor because, I, because I'm in a value community and I'm active on Twitter and I know a lot of value guys and most value guys come to value because they, they learn who Warren Buffett is. Then they read Warren Buffett's letters and they don't progress any further than that. And so their strategy is some variation of what Buffett does. And so that's looking for compound growth and they're looking for quality businesses. And I think sometimes they're prepared to pay too much for those quality businesses. When if you look at what Buffett actually does, so Buffett bought Apple but Buffett bought Apple at roughly the same time I did, and I tweeted about it at the time, so I'm not making this up in, uh, with the benefit of hindsight. I actually was buying it before Buffett was in there. But I was buying it because it was one of the cheapest 10% of large cap stocks around. Not because I thought it was a, a wonderful company at a fair price. I just thought it was a very cheap company. And I think that that's what Buffett's doing too. I think he waits until they're deep value. Then he looks through the deep value ones and he finds the ones that are high quality in a deep value basket. I don't think he's out there looking for these high compound growth ones. But then this community of value guys, they all talk to each other and they all tend to be in the same stocks. You can, and we were, we were talking about this before the podcast, but there's a, a Twitter handle that tracks the, the value portfolios held by popular value investors. And he calls it generic value partners. And generic value partners has a big this is and every single value investor who's a Buffett style value investor has exactly the same portfolio they'll have a big chunk of Berkshire as if you couldn't go and buy Berkshire yourself you got to pay them to hold Berkshire they'll have a big chunk of Fairfax because everybody loves Prem Watson they'll have um, whatever the whatever Buffett's biggest holding is so they'll have Wells Fargo and they might have Bank of America because that's a big holding of Buffett's and Munger likes Bank of America. And they might have DJ Co because that's DJ CO because that's Daily Journal. That's what Munger's in. And then they might have whatever the flavor of the day is. So for a long period of time, the flavor of the day was Valiant. Everybody held Valiant. Sequoia held Valiant to 30% of its assets. You were saying earlier, and I, I know that as well. I was watching that. Um, and, it, and I know a value guy who said to me, Valiant's going to buy my holiday house and Valiant was one of those stocks that I could it was always going to be too expensive for me and as we discussed because we're Australian we've seen lots of busted roll-ups in our time so I was immediately suspicious a Canadian roll-up of what could be a pretty difficult sector to roll up because there's it's healthcare it's it's tough so um, the risk I think to allocators is that they've got five different managers who will follow an identical investment strategy and hold exactly the same stock. So they think they've got five different managers, but they've got five times the same portfolio. And the funny thing is I've, I've tried to explain that to, I went along to a, a very well-known university endowment in the States that has a three letter engineering type name that probably everybody can guess, but I won't name them. I went along to there, they, had a, they invited some managers in to discuss what they were doing. Before any of us discussed what we did, they said what we're looking for and they described the, va- the, the Buffett value style. So I didn't get an opportunity. I sort of listened to what they said and I asked the question, you know, what if that value style goes out of favor? You know, there are different value styles. There are lots of different ways of finding undervalued companies. And they said, well, our experience is this is the one that will give you the best return. Like, well, at this point in the cycle, that's true. You should have said to them, well, I am following the Buffett style, but the, the earlier one. Right, and Buffett partners rather yeah. than Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah, that's right. It's it's funny when people talk to me about, you know, where Buffett, I sort of say which one because I used to think there was three and I think now we're seeing the start of the fourth Buffett. I think that's probably right. Yeah. He's talking more about buying back his own stock and right. doing things that I think he's at another stage where he's realizing he's just managing too much money. He's got to change what he does. 100%. He was a deep value net net liquidation type guy and that was Buffett partnership 
And even when he bought American Express, he was still that sort of deep value. That was a deep value position. And he, he says that he learned when that sort of went up and kept on compounding that you wanted to be in these compounders under the influence of Munger. He then went and tried this wonderful company, which seemed to work very well in the in the scenario where he's still buying very cheap and he's got insurance flow. This is a Berkshire Hathaway model rather than Buffett Partners model. And then he simply gets too big and he can't do that with listed stocks anymore. So then he becomes a private equity investor, which is what he has been probably for the last 25 years. And now we're at the point where he's doing something brand new, which is whatever it's going to be. Yeah, don't look at my price to book anymore. It's not right. You know, we're going to buy back more stock and, uh, yeah, just a, a series of these little things he seems to be foreshadowing in his letters that he's, he's shifting again. Some questions that we ask all of our guests. What are some lessons you've learned the hard way? Every single lesson I've learned, I've learned the hard way because I'm incapable of learning from other people's example and it's the worst thing about me. And I, I am, my wife would say that I'm contrarian to my own detriment. But I'm a genuine contrarian, so, and I, we've discussed some of those lessons that I've learned. Just the, the things that I do wrong is that I think that I'm right when I'm in a position and I want to keep on doubling down on the position. And I'm in a short and the short goes against me and I don't, want to, I don't want to trim the short at all. So I have learned over the last five years in particular that those are dumb things to do. And so I've got better at risk management and better at portfolio management rather than... Um, trying to win on each individual position that I'm taking. So that was the, that's, been the, um, that's been the biggest lesson for me, that really that the, the name of the game, particularly for a value investor, is longevity because you do have extended periods of bad performance and you need to be able to survive through those extended periods of bad performance because when the good performance, when the good periods of value come, it's often at a time when the rest of the market is struggling. And so there's a huge advantage to being a good value investor in that kind of market. So I think we're going to see that. I don't know when, and I, I, I hope it's shorter term than longer term, but I get the feeling that we're going to see a market that looks something more like the early 2000s where value does very well and the rest of the market struggles. But how you capture that is going to be the issue. I think it's going to be a long short. You're going to need to be able to arbitrage because you need to be short that junky decile or whatever it is of the market to generate the returns it's not going to be enough to just be long only in terms of your investment decision making what are three tips that you can give our listeners that they can use to improve their investment decision making so i all of my investment decision making is informed by research and back tests um and i I, there's a there's a process for back testing as well, and, and I know that you're going to talk to Corey Hofstein. He's a good friend of mine as well, and I've learned an enormous amount from Corey because he's a quant in a different type of universe, and Corey has some uh, great ideas about using quantitative or applying the risks with quantitative back testing and so on. But that's that's what I do. So I'm a huge believer in uh, we're all beha- we're all cognitively impaired you know we've got our own cognitive biases and our behavioral errors that we commit and i'm not i'm 100 as bad as everybody else maybe i'm worse than everybody else and the way that i protect myself is by using a written process that i have tested that sits outside of me that if i am wiped out by a truck somebody else can come in and basically sit down in my seat and keep on doing it and it would and it would still hopefully generate the same return so i would say that the first thing is you need to understand why you're doing what you're doing. And you need to be, if you're a value guy, you need to be buying things that are cheap. If you're going to be a momentum guy, you need to be buying things that are going up a lot. But then you also need to understand what your strategy does. And one of the things that value does is it struggles at the end of a bull market. One of the things that momentum does is when the market actually stops going up, it'll be what, I mean, the last value, the last momentum drawdown was something in the order of 90%. The trend is your friend until the end when it bends. Right. <laughs> and then it doesn't work. And then momentum doesn't work for a year or so at the bottom of the... So that's when you want to be a value guy. So I think you need to be self-aware. You need to be aware of your process and you need to document your process and then you need to stick to your process. So that's going to be an individual thing. And I'm not necessarily advocating for out value, even though that's my preferred way of doing it. You can do that with any... If you're a growth guy, you can do the same thing. If you're trying to find you know, the next sort of uh, 
tech stock that's going to take off and compound, you can do the same thing. You're just not using a strict value approach as I'm using. So that's the main one. And then I would say um, you need to, that's sort of one very large idea of documenting and, and knowing what you're doing, knowing what your strategy does. And the other one is just a risk management side. Um, have an idea how much you're prepared to lose in any individual stock. So you don't keep on doing that thing where you double down into stocks that are going against you. Have enough diversification across your portfolio so no individual name will blow you up. You know, avoid debt to the extent that you can do that because it'll keep you in the game for the longest period. And then stick to what you're doing. Be, be prepared to suffer through long periods where it doesn't work. And it doesn't necessarily mean that what you're doing is wrong. But equally, you need to be evaluating if you're not performing. Why, why is that happening? And I think that the way you do that is you look back through similar periods. What did it look like in the 60s? 60s was a very growthy period because that was a conglomerate time. And conglomerates were the tech stocks of the day. Conglomerates were very popular. We've seen that in the late 1990s. And I think we've seen it again now from sort of 2010 to date with dot coms being the, or social media being the sort of new iteration of the web. Cloud as well. Cloud, right. Okay, so there's some great wisdom there that you've been able to share and we're really grateful for that. So congratulations again on the launch of Zig big achievement in getting an ETF launched on the New York Stock Exchange. I'm sure we'll hear more from you soon. Maybe there'll be a zag to go with a zig. But if our listeners want to find out more about what you do and what you're up to, where can they find out more? I have a website called acquirersmultiple.com, which has some stock picks on it. And we blog and we put up podcasts where we talk to value managers and try and find out what their process is. And so I've learned a lot from talking to other value guys. They have some great insights. I've written a, a number of books. The most recent one's called The Acquirer's Multiple. came out in 2017. It's written to uh, an eighth grade reading level. And the idea is that you can read it in two hours and it's pretty simple to understand. There's not a lot of jargon in there. If you want the more academic versions of things that I've written, Quantitative Value came out in 2012 and that's full of backtesting. We took every bit of academic and industry research we could find and tested it. And then Deep Value, which sort of describes my philosophy but it's a little bit more difficult to read than the acquirer's multiple. And then on the portfolio side, I wrote Concentrated Investing, where we went and found guys who had 25-year track records of outperformance as value guys, and they were concentrated. We talked to them about what they did, how they achieved those ends, and that's where we, we do some analysis of Kelly and other diversification and concentration, that Graham and Klarman and Buffett and Munger, and all of these, Lou Simpson, all these value guys have used in their portfolios. So I try, I try to build that into my process. So if you want to understand my process, reading those books is a good way of doing it. And I'm on Twitter at Greenbacked. It's a funny spelling, G-R-E-E-N-B-A-C-K-D. And I tweet out inanities all day long. Very good. Well, Toby, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. And who knows, maybe we can record something when you're in Australia next time. I'd love to. Thanks, Danny. That was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the i3 podcast. For more information, please visit www.i3-invest.com. Thank you very much. 